Hey, this is Victoria, and I'm here again with James, aka Simon Black, uh, who has some amazing news to share. And the news is that he just had the baby recently in Mexico. How do you feel? Uh, I mean, uh, amazing. Um, I'm, you know, it's <laughs> my first, so I'm in my early 40s. So a lot of people get started like in their <laughs> in their teens 20s? and 20s, <laughs> or at least, yeah. I mean, it's like I feel like I got a lot of friends that are that are having kids now but they're like in their in their early 30s so I mean I'm definitely late to the game and it's one of those things I never thought I would do but you know that's um you know you change your you change your point of view about, about a lot of things in life and that was one of the things I really changed my point of view on last year and um anyways long story short yeah um made a conscious decision to have the baby here in Mexico and it was I got, I just got to say one of the best, I, I could not have asked for a better experience than what we had here in Mexico. It was everything about it was just phenomenal. My experience here has been just phenomenal. If people have been reading notes from the field, like, Oh, he's in Cancun. Oh, he's been there for a little while. <laughs> That's what I've been doing here. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to tell us why Mexico, why you chose Mexico out of yeah. all the places? Yeah. Of all the places in the world. Well, so <laughs> Um, my baby has five passports. Um, that's cool, but to be honest, not because there were so many, that wasn't really the main driver. Um, it, it didn't really affect the calculus a whole lot, but I'll, I will tell you, so I live in Puerto Rico. Um, that is my primary residence and, and I have my house there and all my stuff and everything is, is in Puerto Rico. Um, I spent almost the entirety of last year there, you know, like, like a lot of people didn't exactly travel a whole lot, but when, um, you know, when, 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 you know, we knew the baby was coming uh, late last year, immediately started kind of thinking about, okay, where, you know, where are we going to do this? And the thing is, there are a lot of just total honesty. There are a lot of really wonderful things about Puerto Rico. Um, like any place, there's some wonderful things and there's some not wonderful things. And in my experience, um, and I would say, Victoria, yours too, yeah. um, one of the not so great experiences uh, has been, uh, at least personally, other people may have different experiences, yeah. but uh, personally, what I experienced, and I know some of the things that you've witnessed as well, uh, from in terms of the medical care, I just thought, this isn't where I'm going to have my child. This not, is not the best be place here. for that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, there was one night, uh, uh, a long time ago, I mean, it would have been in, uh, I don't know, late, in the fall of last year, for example, I had a, like a late night trip to the emergency room. And it was, it was just horrible, just horrible, um, you know, dealing with that, um, you know, going through some experiences, trying to deal with the hospital uh, system uh, early in the pregnancy of when we were still in Puerto Rico, and having to deal with that, I mean, I remember and she was telling me, you know, it's like I, I was trying to get a hold of one of the OBGYNs in the clinic. And I was a little just calling and calling and calling, could not get anybody to answer the phone. I mean, it's just things about it that are honestly kind of typical uh, for Puerto Rico. Again, not a, not a negative judgment on Puerto Rico as a whole. There are a lot of really wonderful things about it. But the experiences that we had, and I know you had as yeah. You know, at least you witnessed some bizarre things. And as a guy in Puerto Rico that you knew who who got COVID and was basically thrown out of the hospital. He was left on the, sitting on a on a sidewalk, dumped, basically. Dumped onto the street um, yeah. out of the hospital because they just didn't want to deal with it. And it's like, oh my God. I mean, it's just and so I just uh, sort of the 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 aggregate of all those things together, just thought, in no way uh, am I gonna have my child here. So the first thing that came to mind, the first place that came to mind was Chile. Chile, yeah, you spent a lot of and, time there. Right, exactly. And so, um, you know, I'm still you know, chairman of the agriculture business there and, and, you know, just have a great network, you know, very close to a lot of people in Chile, um, have a lot of people who can kind of help out, have a, you know, place to stay with land where, you know, everything, all the food is organic and, and yeah. it's off grid and, and, you know, clean water and, you know, uh, solar panels and everything, you know, you eat comes from the garden and the people go mm -hmm. out and they pick the tomatoes and they make it, the, you know, and it's just like, and I, I thought, well, that's perfect. That, that's the place I think, you know, if, if, if you're, you know, going to be pregnant and, uh, you know, you want to be in a really clean place. I mean, it's, it's just a perfect place to be. 
But you know me, like I'm always a, you know, I'm a plan A, plan B kind of guy. And in January, uh, we were already kind of thinking about, okay, where's the plan B? And in January, um, uh, you know, Victoria, we had our event in Cancun. That's right. And yeah. we, had a, we had a total access event in Cancun. And one of the people, one of the speakers there was sort of in, the, in medical tourism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was talking about medical tourism. And I kind of pulled him aside. We we're talking about babies and said, you know, one of the things do you do, do you do, you know, do you do births in Mexico? He goes, oh, yeah, it's like my biggest thing that I do. And he's a Russian guy. And so most of the most of his clients um, are Russian. And so they come over from from like Russia and whatever, Kazakhstan and Ukraine and Belarus and yeah. stuff. And they have their babies uh, here in Mexico. And he said, it's it's brisk business. And, and it's funny is because all those guys in Russia and Belarus, et cetera, they come here because they know that the baby is going to be born with a Mexican passport. And that for them, that's a really big deal, because, you know, if you're from Belarus, or something like that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Like your passport mm -hmm. is not a good quality passport. You can't really go to too many places. You need visas everywhere. Mexico is a good quality passport. Yeah. I'm not sure where it ranks in our sovereign man passport ranking, but it's, it's definitely a lot higher than Belarus. It's pretty, it's definitely. pretty good passport to have. Yeah. yeah. And you can go a lot of places visa free, you know, even Europe and all over Latin America, et cetera. It's a good passport to have. And those guys, like in, in different parts of the world, like in Eastern Europe and former Soviet republics, they get that. They understand that intuitively. You don't have to yeah. explain that to them. Like, no. oh, well, I get this good passport. So, so you know, so this 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 uh, gentleman that runs this, you know, sort of medical tourism business here, he's like, yeah, it, it's it's hugely popular with a lot of people in former Soviet republics, um, and so they all come over here. But and I said, okay, well, I, I'm interested, and you know, but for me, the most important thing, obviously, is the quality of the care. Sure, the passport's fine, but no matter what, like, she's going to have a ton of passports anyways. It's all fine. So I just want to know how's the quality of the care. And so we sat down, we had a bunch of, at that point, I was already back in Puerto Rico. It was after the event was over. We'd flown back to Puerto Rico, but we started setting up Zoom meetings with the physicians and the different facilities and things like that. And it was great. I thought, okay, yeah, this is perfect. Because for me, you know, the, the um, we were talking about the natural, you know, wanted to do a natural birth process yeah. and all this sort of thing. And uh, it's a really big deal for her. She said, I don't want to have a C-section at all. And, and you know, if it, if, uh, unless it's absolutely, you know, medically necessary. And essentially because, you know, C-sections have become more and more prominent um, around the world. And, and, you know, you listen to some doctors talk about it. And in some respects, um, you know, it happens just because either the doctor isn't willing to take any risks at all, or they just, you know, don't want their schedule to be terribly inconvenienced. Yeah. Um, you know, in different in different parts of the world, in Latin America in particular, C sections are um, more often what happens in pregnancies. Natural birth is actually quite rare, and so we were very clear with the physician. We said, "Look, if we end up doing Mexico, that's the standard. Under no circumstances do we want a cesarean unless it is unless it is medically necessary, literally to save the life of the mother or child." So um, we were really happy with. The conversations we thought okay we're totally on the same page we've got a um, a doctor who herself actually had um you know young young children and had gone sort of third thing herself and it was just it was you know perfect and so we thought okay yeah we we like mexico we and our we felt we felt like our plan b was so good we were already sort of thinking like maybe this is plan a um and that's really the kind of the goal of a great plan b you love your plan b's it's so it's so good you start yeah. thinking like maybe this is actually plan a but at that point we went back to Chile and then, you know, so we were in Chile and it was like March, uh, late, late February. I think I went back to Chile and, um, you know, we're there, we were at one of the farms and it was great. It was just, you know, it was perfect. It was ideal, uh, you know, February, March, that's summertime in South America. And so it was just, you know, all the organic fruits, everything is ripe, the vegetables and the corn and the wheat and, you know, with going out and taking the olives and pressing olive oil and everything. It's totally self-sufficient out there. I mean, you have, we have wheat, we take the grain, and bake our own bread and everything. It's just, it's perfect. It's perfect. But, you know, then the, the government of Chile started, you know, acting pretty funny. And then they, it, this is summertime now. And so then they started imposing local lockdowns. It was sort of sector by sector, municipality by municipality. They said, okay, this little municipality, we're going to put you, they had this system, it's paso uno, paso dos, paso tres. And then they, then, and so they said, okay, we're going to put these guys in the more severe lockdowns and these guys in the, the, the weekend lockdown. So you're out, you could go live your life 
in the capital city of Santiago Monday through Friday, then the weekends came and everybody had to stay home mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things. And I thought, this is weird to me because simultaneously they are really pushing vaccines out to everybody. And we know a lot of people that had them. And at the time, Chile was, and still is, one of the most vaccinated countries in the world uh, in terms of its you know, percentage of the adult population, population mm -hmm. in general that's vaccinated. And yet they were going and they're saying, oh, our COVID cases are going through the roof and, and you know, everybody's got to keep getting vaccinated, but you have to stay home. And it's like, whoa, 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 hang on, buddy. You can't have it both ways. You know, you yeah. can't have it both ways and then say everything's fine and going according to plan and keep getting vaccinated, but keep locking yourselves down. It just doesn't work like that. You, you know, you can't have it both ways. And, and it just made me think they started with the restrictions and increasing the restrictions and increasing the restrictions. And I just thought, nah you know what, like they're, they're going to do something stupid. And then, you know, by the time my child is born, it's going to be winter time in mm -hmm. South America. You know, this is, this is winter time now. And these things, these restrictions, everything, they always seem to get more severe in the winter time anyways, uh, as experience has kind of shown us. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to risk it. Where they come up with some stupid rule where they're going to say, you know, whatever, dad can't be in the delivery room, mm -hmm. you know, which I, I, I would, I would lose my mind if somebody tried to keep me out or yeah. you know or you know mommy's got to sit there with her mask on you know double, double masks oh to, you know while she's giving birth you know what it's just some stupid thing like that and I thought I just I don't I don't trust it now it's not going to happen and then um right before was would have been right before the Easter holiday which is in Latin America if anybody has been down there knows it's a big deal um it's it's basically like Christmas and New Year sort of all over again. it's a really big deal and they, uh, right before, so it was like, you know, start sort of on Good Friday. So on Thursday afternoon, late Thursday afternoon, they made an announcement and they said, okay, so the whole place is going to shut down basically for a four day weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and like probably Monday too. Um, and uh, right before this long weekend, they said, hey, we're going to, we're going to lock everybody down again. We're going to, and then we're going to close the borders. Yeah. And closing the borders, they meant not only we're going to keep people from coming in to the country, into Chile, but we're also going to prevent people from leaving. And that immediately was like, I'm out. And so, you know, we, she and I got, we basically, we were on the next flight out. Yeah, and just um, to know, the borders are still closed. You, you need the, the borders permit. Are closed. And they said, they said, <laughs> they said, oh, leave. it's, a, it's a, we're only going to be closed for 30 days. Basically, yeah. before, before the month of April is over, the borders will be open. And I thought, no chance. They kept no extending and, and extending. And so right, it's right. And now, you know, then they said, oh, now it's going to be mid-May. Then it was late May. Then it was mid-June. Now it's late June. And now, you know, now, you know, it's probably going to be, who knows? Who knows? And that's an important lesson, I think, with, with government policy in general. Whenever yeah. they come up with something, it's like a temporary tax. You know, there's no tax that's temporary. It doesn't yeah. exist. They just keep, they said, oh, we're going to extend it a little bit more and extend it for emergency powers temporary emergency powers there's no temporary emergency powers they, they you know the government still has its temporary emergency powers from 9 11 you know 20 years ago they still have their their temporary powers uh that they're supposed to give back immediately after the crisis and so this, this is the sort of sort of rule with government policies i thought no and that was the moment it was in late march that immediately plan b became plan a and so we we're on the next flight we came to mexico and what was interesting is that um you know, one of the one of the cool things about Chile um, is that they have a very liberal uh, immigration policy to where uh, it's gotten a lot more difficult only because the system is so backlogged uh, because so many people have taken advantage of this. But uh, it used to be incredibly easy to obtain residency in Chile. And it's still a, a straightforward process. It just takes a lot longer because yeah. because so many people are you know, just straining the system. Uh, but there's just, I mean, just so many people that have come from all over the world, from Haiti, from Venezuela, from other places, um, and so many immigrants that have really strained the immigration system in Chile. Uh, but there's, a, you know, there are just so many workers that we've brought in from all over the world uh, to, you know, just to, to do different things. And so I, I brought a couple of them with me to Mexico. And that was one of the cool things about Mexico um, is that you know, they're, they're quite welcoming as well. And I remember when we, when we, when we came in, we landed in Mexico city and I was a, I was a little bit, you know, I, I always, when I cross a border and I'm dealing with immigration people anywhere in the world, I always like think to myself, okay, I got to get my story straight. <laughs> what I'm going to tell these guys. And like, I didn't have a return ticket. 
You know, I didn't have a ticket out of Mexico. And that's generally when you cross a border, as you know, and you've done it a million yeah. times. And the first thing they ask you is like, how long are you going to, how long are you staying? Yeah. And, you know, I was just, I was just straight with a guy. And I said, I said, honestly, dude, I don't know. And he's like, what do you mean? And I go, I go, well, we were just in Chile and they just closed the borders. And so we left immediately and we came here and he just looked at me and he's like, oh my God. And he just stamped all of our passports. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And he's like, welcome to Mexico. And I'm like, <laughs> like, that's the answer I was looking for. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then we spent, we didn't have a place to stay yet. We spent a couple of, a couple of nights at that, at that resort that, oh, that you found yeah, for us. Right. Yeah. In, uh, in, uh, Playa Mujeres, uh, yeah. which is an amazing place. And yeah, I, I texted James, I, mean, remember, I was, said, I said, I found a hotel where you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> He's like, I'm yeah, there. I was like, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, now that's, that's in a lot of parts of the world now that's kind of normal, but I mean, back in April, it was, I mean, there was just, yeah. you couldn't find a place like that. And it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. We had such a good time. And then we found a, a beautiful apartment uh, here in Cancun. And uh, basically, yeah, it's just kind of been, been camped out here. And really, I just got to say, like my, in general, my Mexico experience, everybody has their own experiences and, and every place has its own sort of advantages and disadvantages. And so for me, I've been smack dab in Cancun proper. And this whole area, they call it... Uh, uh, I mean, really, all, a lot of people just kind of call it Cancun. They call it the, the, the Riviera, the Maya, the Mayan Riviera, uh, basically. Um, and it's kind of this area from, from Cancun going down the coast all the way past Playa del Carmen and to Tulum, which, uh, you know, are in some respects maybe a little bit less touristy than, than Cancun. You might, when you think Cancun, you might think like drunken teenagers at spring yeah. break and all that kind of stuff. My experience has been um, exceptional. So like I'm in Cancun proper, like even like in the middle of the, of the hotel zone, like in the tourist, uh, I mean, this is the tourist spot where I am. And I never like, I've never really a touristy guy. I mean, I've been to Paris probably a hundred times. I don't think I've ever been to the Eiffel Tower. Like it's just, I'm just not that kind of person. Um, but my experiences in Mexico have and in Cancun have just been extraordinary. Um, I live a normal life. I mean, I, I go to the gym, I go, you know, to, 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 you know, restaurants, I mean, all that sort of thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not going to Senor Frogs and, and, and <laughs> discos, whatever. Like, I'm way, I'm way past that point in my life. And it's just, you know, it's just not really what I'm doing. I'm just living a normal kind of life, just happen to be doing so in Cancun. But what I would say is, at least where I am, um, it's, it's just been phenomenal. Now, why do I say that? So number one is the, so first of all, it's, it's really cheap here. Yeah. Um, and that's been great. Number two, the quality of the stuff that we have here, the quality of the things you find just about anything that you want. There's the, I don't know if there's been anything where I thought, oh, I really wish I could get, you know, whatever, and then I haven't been able to get it. I've been able to get a lot of stuff, even stuff that I haven't been able to find in other places. Really, really high quality stuff, whatever you're into, foods and wine, and, you know, just whatever. They, they've yeah. got it here. Uh, um, and, you know, it's the... Whereas, I mean, you, you and I talk about this a lot, Victoria, I mean, um, you were just in Miami, you're talking about all the, you know, the help wanted places. I mean, all these businesses that were driven out of business, either yeah. because of COVID or because of the consequences after COVID where they couldn't find workers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that problem here. Here they have yeah. actual real economic problems because the economy has been slow and sluggish and a recovery slow and sluggish. And they were having, they're kind of going into recession even before COVID. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, yeah, I mean, whatever it is you want, if you're looking for, for work or you're looking for uh, people to hire for certain, whatever it is that you need, yeah. there's plenty of labor available. Um, people honestly do want to work and create value. People really want to work. Wanna help you, yeah. Yeah, we have this, we, so we, we have this apartment we rented um, it's a, in a beautiful place. Um, and I remember when I walked in the master bedroom and I'm like looking around going, something's missing here. And I realized it was, uh, there was no closet. And it was a, a bit of a kind of a strange, you know, floor plan, but it's a, it's a lovely place. Uh, but yeah, there's no closet in the master bedroom. And so we called the guy we, we rented the place from. It's the same guy that owns um, several of the major um, hotels here. And, and, and he's, he's the owner of this place. And he's been, he's been great. And, and we're like, hey, look, there's no, you know, could you guys like kind of bring us like an armoire or something? You know, we could hang up our clothes. He's like, he's like, yeah, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it done. Well, the next day, actually later that day, some guys came in and they started taking measurements. And then the next day, 
a whole crew of uh, people came in and custom built a closet, <laughs> like a, a like a, a like an actual like closet, like right there, like in the room, and it just like crazy thing. And they, I mean, they they did the whole thing. They finished it in two days. The, one of the, the the foreman for the crew was such a perfectionist, <laughs> and that when they were they got to the point where they were hanging doors on certain on the wardrobe closets and things like that, and he didn't have it wasn't like exactly right, and he would not leave until it was just perfectly and you could just kind of knock it with your fingertips and it would open and close per, and everything and all and i just i thought well that's that's incredible you know and then it's it's a small example of the sort of kind of experience that, that that i've had here and again people have different experiences but it was it was really great we found some uh exceptional you know restaurants and, and just things we really like the gym that i work out at is uh is amazing i mean you've seen it it's it's, yeah, it's, it's really it's perfect. great yeah it's great it's it's perfect you know and nobody's chasing you around wanting you to put on 18 masks yeah. and, a, and, a, and, a, and a face shield and you know hazmat suit and all this sort of stuff i mean you just free you know just you do you and you're free to do whatever uh so yeah i i really like, like it but from a medical care perspective when was that probably a month and a half ago i'm trying to remember now um I, I was having like some, some, oh, some tooth right. problems. Yeah. yeah. I was having some tooth problems and, and I, I, I went into the dentist and it's gosh, so cheap and, and uh, yeah, they did some x-rays and they look, I said, you know, you got some, you got some hardcore, like wisdom tooth, you know, impaction where these things are about to erupt. It's going to be a big problem for you. And I thought, okay, I, I want to deal with this now. Like, I don't want to wait until after my child's born, whatever. I just want to take care of it. So I booked an appointment. Um, I, I chickened out. <laughs> And I booked another one. <laughs> and, um, and anyways, I had this surgeon come in. Now I had, I had a wisdom tooth. I had this one done my lower, whatever, on the left side, like 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and I was, uh, I was visiting Matt in Iowa and I had like, it's just this like emergency thing. It was weird. I had like an infection in my head, all this stuff as a result. It was really nasty. Um, it was so long ago, actually, I hadn't even met you yet. That's how long, that's how far back that goes. You and I, <laughs> you and I have known each other forever. So, um, yeah. <laughs> this, this is a long time ago. And anyways, I went in and it was like, I, this, this is in Iowa. And I never forget this because I mean, I'd never had anything like that before. Um, yeah, I was like in my late twenties and this like really like burly guy in scrubs walks in and he's the oral surgeon <laughs> and you know, he, he gives me a shot of Novocaine and he takes like, it, I mean, it was like a crowbar and this, and he's this. <laughs> like like muscular guy and he's just like wailing away and i'm like i'm i'm awake you know and i'm just looking at this guy going oh my god like uh, you just <laughs> not what i would have expected if i had uh, and he finally pulled this thing out and oh you know i had my tooth and that's what i was expecting but then i walked in and the and this the surgeon walked in here in cancun it was this little petite lady <laughs> and i just thought there's no way she's going to get it done and she just went Boop, and it, in seconds and, and, and I was like, did you get it? She goes, yeah, it's right here. And she showed me the tooth and she did the other three, sewed me up. I was out of there in, I don't know, less than an hour. That was so quick for you, yeah. And yeah, and, and, and I was like, and I was waiting for the anesthesia wife. I'm like, this is gonna be so much pain. And then she gave me, you know, she gave me a prescription for painkillers and I sent somebody out to the drugstore to get painkillers and I never used them because I, I mean, she did such an incredible job yeah. And I, I mean, that my, the first day it was like a little bit, felt like a little bit itchy, but I, I didn't actually feel any real pain. I woke up the next morning. I thought, okay, no, this is going to hurt. And, and then I never, I never really had any pain. Two days later, I went out to my favorite steak restaurant, <laughs> um, you know, and I went back, I actually booked a follow-up appointment later that week just to go in and say, I just want you to know <laughs> that you are amazing. And I was just getting to know her and her story. And she's actually Venezuelan. Oh, wow. And she's like, I came to Mexico because things are so crappy in my country and yeah. like this is a place I just wanted to practice medicine and, and to do what I do and then have you know be able to perform surgery whatever I came to Mexico and she's yeah. like they welcomed me here with open arms she said tell me it's her story about how easy it was for her to come in and obtain residency here and the legal permission to work and everything like that she said I've been here for you know 15 years or whatever and and That's she amazing. said her for her like you know it was it was a really great story to be able to come to Mexico and now she's got a great practice and a great business and it was great and it was it cost um, you a fraction of the cost what it would be in the u.s right it was like a couple hundred bucks you know to have all my my wisdom yeah. teeth removed um but that's i mean so now i want to get to the baby 
All right. Because, <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about shocking in terms of price, let alone quality. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you, so the physician that we have is, again, when I said earlier, I could not have asked for a better experience giving birth in Mexico. Well, I really need to stop using the first person out. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, as the dad, I could not have asked for a better experience. Um, but, um, and she would say the same thing. She's in the yeah. other room, but, uh, um, and you know, that like, I mean, we, we had such an incredible experience. So our, our physician um, was, I, the only way I, I, she is, she's like a goddess. Uh, in every possible way, she, her knowledge, um, her bedside manner, the, just the, the, the level of care and attention that she provided. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. So, um, so we were, you know, as soon as we got here, we were doing, uh, you know, we were doing, uh, you know, we were immediately going in um, to the clinic and getting, you know, having appointments, doing ultrasounds, you know, every time we're going in, obviously, and and all the checkups and everything like that. And she was, she was always so just really great, really thorough, so kind, so sweet. Um, you know, I would, I was telling some friends, um, you know, when we went to the, uh, we went to the Atlas um, 400 yeah. um, annual meeting in May and I was telling, there's a lot of physicians in the group and I was telling them about this, you know, they're like, what's it like in Mexico? You know, and I'm like, it's amazing. And so we, we go into all these appointments and, you know, at the end, you know, I would pay in cash it would be 1500 pesos, which is about $75. And I always felt like, well, that's a great deal because she would spend so much time with us. But more importantly, I literally never once waited in line. <laughs> I never once filled out a form. I was never given any paperwork. I yeah. literally did. I mean, like I, I, would, I would show up, we would get to the clinic. We'd go right in. I mean, there was no waiting room. There was no, like, I would just go walk, walk right into her office and, oh, hi, you know, and we'd sit down and we'd, you know, and they'd just take us over to the ultrasound and all that. And then, you know, we would leave. I'd give, you know, and every time it was just, I would even stop. I would just take three 500 peso bills out of my wallet and I'd lay it on the counter um, and walk out the door. And, the, and we had a night and the lady would wave to me. Um, you know, she was like the appointment keeper and cashier or whatever. And, and that was it. And, I, and like, people couldn't believe it. Like, what do you mean there's no paperwork? I'm like, there's literally no paperwork. I never signed up anything. I never filled out a form, I never did anything. And so just the level of efficiency alone relative to the price was a major advantage, yeah. but the quality of the care. And so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go on now and just kind of give you a little bit of explanation in terms of the quality of the care. So um, it was, you know, we, so we had to, we had to induce, we were, we were hoping to not have to do that, but, you know, relatives, babies tend to get bigger and, you know, certain women are quite petite <laughs> and it gets to the point where, you know, baby can outgrow the womb. Uh, and if that happened, plus she was late. And, uh, and so, you know, when that happens then the risk for C-section goes up a lot. So we said, okay, we don't want to do that. So the doctor said, okay, well, there's some things we can do to induce. And we tried the the teas and the droplets and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it just wasn't working. And the baby just wasn't interested in, in showing and in coming out into this world just yet. So I said, okay, so we did a, a medical inducement. And so we had an appointment with the doctor and, and she said, okay, here, here's a fish. She had it sitting right there. She said, here, take this, take one of these, and then you know, take another one in the morning. And then I said, okay, and we had, um, we had, a, we had a doula that was assigned as this Russian guy, uh, assigned us a doula who came to all the appointments with us. And, uh, and I said, okay, why don't you guys wait outside for a minute? I'm going to talk to the doctor by myself. And so um, I sat with, I said, look, um, you know, so we're going to take this pill tonight. She's going to go into labor tomorrow morning. She's like, yeah, that's right. I said, okay, look, I want you to come over to my house tomorrow. I want you to clear your calendar. And I want you to come over to my house tomorrow. She's like, okay. <laughs> so, and, and, and I said, I know you've got, I know you've got young children because she usually works in the afternoon and, mm -hmm. and all that. I said, bring your, bring your kids over to my house. Um, you know, uh, we've got plenty of people who can take care of them, whatever. She's like, okay. So at eight o'clock the next morning, um, she shows up to my house with her kids in tow and her mom, uh, who she brought along to help take care of the kids. And basically, you know, we spent all day 
you know, and where and then the, the labor, the contraction started uh, around nine. And, and so basically she was there all day. She brought like equipment, you know, the, she's monitoring the baby's heart rate and all that kind of stuff. Um, kind of mini ultrasound, all this stuff all day long. And then around, and then the pain, the contractions and the pains got so bad, probably right, maybe like six o'clock or something like that. Mm -hmm. At that point, her mom had taken her kids home and she was still there with us. I spent all day with us in my house. We got in the car and we drove to the hospital, maybe like five, six o'clock. And we went to the hospital, we went straight up to the delivery room. They have a beautiful facility where whatever it is you want to do, um, she wanted to do a water birth. And so they had the, the hot tub kind of all there filled up and, and everything was great. And we went straight into the, um, into the delivery room and, you know, the contractions kept going and going and going. We thought, we thought, okay, well, you know, maybe the baby be born tonight. She was not born that night. <laughs> you know, it was like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. I mean, it was, it was, it, very it, long it, kept, it kept, oh, it was a very, a very long night. I mean, it was 23 <laughs> hours of labor. The doctor did not leave our side just to go to the bathroom. That's I mean, insane. did not leave our <laughs> side all night, sat there all night. Didn't, oh, I got, I got to go do some paperwork. I got this and that. I'm going to stay from, from, from eight o'clock in the morning until basically 24 hours did not leave our side. And and, you know, and then when the real fun began, you know, the fireworks, with the, the whole thing and the way, because I had never done this before. So I thought it was like, you know, I, and, you know, if you don't have kids, it's not like it is in the movies. If you have kids, you're like, yeah, why would you think it's like what it is in the movies? It's, I, I'm, I'm an idiot. I thought it was like, like you see on TV, whatever. It's not like it is on TV. Yeah. Maybe the last few minutes, a little bit, whatever. But I mean, it's just, it's just a long, long, you know, waiting process. And then a whole lot of drama in between where all of a sudden it's like, you know, the, the dilation isn't whatever. And, the, and there's like risks that come up along the way. Yeah. And, you know, there's a certain part where, I mean, not to get too much in this, but like, you know, the baby was stuck and I mean, it, it was, it was a whole thing. And like, and she, she, you know, really kind of, I mean, her skills really shined um, at that point, her, her, her medical knowledge and her skills really shined because she was able to make, I mean, there's so many things that are going on and she was able to make on the spot decisions in real time. I mean, it was like, it reminded me of just back in my army days when you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're in an environment and like, you just got to make decisions in real time. There's all this shit happening all around you. And you just got to rise above all that, keep cool and do what you got to do. And she was just perfect. She's bringing in all these different things and doing all the things that were necessary to accomplish the mission which was safe, natural delivery of the child without a cesarean. And so that's what she accomplished. And there were some very risky moments, hmm. but she was, able to, she was able to make it happen. And, um, uh, and anyways, so after all that, basically 24 hours straight with us. And then she's, and I thought, okay, she's, uh, like, she's gonna go crash, whatever she's gonna, she stayed with us. And, and, you know, and then, and finally, you know, we went, we went back to then we moved from uh the delivery room to like we we had um pre-booked a, a we, we pre-booked the presidential suite which is actually a lot i mean it was lovely the hotel the hospital had a had a presidential suite which was like a large i mean it was, it was like a, a living room and like a separate bedroom and then a primary bedroom i mean it was a huge bathroom and it was it was it was nice i mean for a hospital um it was it was nice yeah and um, she came with us to the suite, stayed with us for a little while. And, and, and so this is now like a couple of hours after the delivery and she's still there <laughs> and just talking to us and, you know, um, you know, uh, providing like coaching on breastfeeding and all these sorts of things. And, and then she finally left. And, um, because another one of her patients had gone into labor. And so then she went to the, uh, to the living room again to go and deliver the other baby. But the other baby was like really fast and the labor was, it was like our third child or something like that. So the labor was like an hour and a half, whatever. And that was it. And she came back <laughs> and it was, what was amazing was that at that point, everybody was awake and the baby was having a little bit of trouble at, at you know, latching on. And, and so the, the breastfeeding wasn't going very well. And so she came back and, you know, she was again, like kind of coaching and said, this is how you should do it and, da, da, da. and the baby was still having trouble 
And she said, well, let me try. I remember I said, she has young kids. So she <laughs> took the baby, she went to the other room and she started breastfeeding our child. That's crazy. <laughs> and I just thought, is there no limit to what this woman is willing to do for me and for my family and for our child? Is there yeah. no limit? I, I, just, I, just, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, I have no words to express how extraordinary yeah. um, she was. And I have to say too, it wasn't just her because then there was a whole team. There was an anesthesiologist who we didn't really use very much of uh, services. Uh, then a pediatrician came in. It was funny because at the end, again, because the baby was kind of stuck. And so the, so it was like, you know, me and the pediatrician were like literally pushing on her belly. And then the doctor was like, I mean, it was this whole team effort, but everybody was great. Everybody was great. Um, the nurses, the staff, even the orderlies who were coming in, cleaning up. I mean, everybody was, was, was polite, professional, courteous. Yeah. I was blown away, but I mean, but the, 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 just the coup de grace for the whole thing, just at the very end, it all, she, 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 she's breastfeeding my child trying to, you know, help. I, 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 I was just blown away. Yeah. I was blown away. Now, all that all together, all that kind of service, just the perfection, the, just, just the level of care and attention and all the physicians and all the staff and all the people, the hospital, the water birth, the facilities and the presidential suite <laughs> that everything all together was 70,000 pesos, which is about $3,500. Yeah. That's incredible. You tell me where you are gonna find yeah. A deal like that. With that kind of quality. $3,500 for that kind of quality. I can't even I was imagine. Blo I was blown away. I was blown away. That has been my experience here. That has been my experience. Yeah. I've been blown away. Uh, we've had, you know, I mean, people made house calls. We had to go to the pediatrician the other day. Uh, everything's fine. Uh, we, we went to the pediatrician on Saturday. <laughs> Sent the guy a sent the guy a text. We talk, all these people we talk to on 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 uh, you know we we text them. You know, they use WhatsApp or trying to get everybody to shift to like Signal or. or no, telephone. they love their WhatsApps <laughs> in Mexico. <laughs> they love WhatsApp. Yeah, they love WhatsApp. But it's huge. Oh, everyone in Latin America, everybody's on WhatsApp. Now yeah. I don't use WhatsApp anymore because I hate Zuckerberg uh, and <laughs> and uh, everything that he's done to privacy. But that's a whole other thing. Um, anyways. Uh, I'm probably going to get banned from from something for saying that, but anyways, my, the Facebook censors are going to cancel this this podcast. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but anyways, uh, but yeah, I mean, you text everybody. So we text the pediatrician. This is on Saturday. This guy's day off. We said, hey, we you know we think there's a and so yeah, no problem. Come into my come into my office. I'll meet you there. So we go over to the guy's office. You know, he spends. I mean, does a very thorough. Everything's fine but he's incredibly thorough examination, all sorts of stuff. And, and you gave us all sorts of you know, great advice. I said, if you see this then do this, I mean, cause it's my first child, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, you know, he's like, you know, try this, do this. I mean, it was like this whole laundry list of stuff and he spent forever with us. And then you were sitting there and it's like, you know, in the end I'm like, okay, so, you know, and, and I'm like, how, how much? It's like, oh, it's six, uh, what was it? Yeah, 600, 600 pesos. That's no $30. It's $30. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's not even a copay. <laughs> if you have the best, if you have the best insurance plan in the world in the United States, you got the best, you know, you have the perfect, whatever Obama envisioned when he came up with Obamacare, <laughs> you know, yeah. with what with what healthcare was supposed to be. Even then, you couldn't deal with $30. And I just thought, oh my God, you know, so I gave the guy a thousand just because I'm like, this is. I'm like, you know, please, like, yeah. But again, that's like that's just consistently been my experience here is just incredibly high quality of service with people that really, 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 truly care. And even then, like the same thing, didn't fill out any paperwork, didn't sign anything, didn't stay in line. I mean, he opened the office just for me. <laughs> I mean, his they were closed. There was nobody else there. He didn't have a receptionist or anything like that. It's just you know, that's been the, the, the quality that I have received consistently and the prices that I've been paying, I just been, I've been blown away. No, this so is just such an incredible story. 
it was a, it was, it was what a great decision to have the baby here. So now let's talk about the other stuff, right? Well, it's like the cherry on top now, I feel like. (laughs) Right. The cherry on top, which I said, I said, this didn't even factor into my calculus at all. Yeah. But be that as it may. So my child is a Mexican citizen because she was born here. So she's going to get that along with a whole bunch of other passports. So she's got all these passports now. Um, I would say we don't have the passports yet. She's just, she's, I mean, all she's doing is sleeping and pooping or whatever. So we, we, we <laughs> try to go until we have. <laughs> yeah. So, but she has all these citizenships and nationalities. So, um, oh, that's one of the other things. So, so we had, we had somebody from the, from the, like the administrative office, like the, the, the Mexican, you know, statistical office, whatever, come over to my house to hand deliver the official birth certificate and had made three, cause she, she's like, no, nah, you're probably gonna need a copy at some point. So she went and made three official notarized copies for us as well. So we just have it um, just in case. So just like, they came over to my house. Like, I was just like, we had a knock at the door. I'm like, who's this? And some lady came in. And she's like, oh yeah, I'm from the which and whatever call it office. And I was like, this is amazing. And, uh, and so, <laughs> so, so yeah, so baby's, uh, baby's uh, Mexican national along with all the others that she mm-hmm. has as well. Um, mommy and daddy get instant permanent residency as well, because as the yeah. father of a Mexican national, um, I am entitled to permanent residency. The cool thing about permanent residency in Mexico is it's not like permanent residency in other places. Um, even for example, like, a, 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 in the United States, like a U.S. green card, we say, oh, you have permanent residency, but it's a conditional permanent residency. It's provisional permanent residency. You have to renew it. You've got to go back and reapply and all these sorts of things. And that's actually quite common in a lot of parts of the world. In Mexico, permanent residency is actually permanente. It is, Truly permanent. I don't have to go and reapply. I don't have to whatever. I don't have to grovel. I don't have to, you know, whatever. It's just like, I'm for life. I'm a permanent mm-hmm. resident now in Mexico because my child was born here. Grandma and grandpa, it goes another generation. Grandma and grandpa can get permanent residency because their, their grandchild was born here in Mexico. And I don't actually, I don't know about them. I need to ask the question. Uh, it might be the same for them, but for me, at least for mommy and daddy, um, we have permanent residency and we are entitled to Mexican citizenship uh, if we live here for two years. And it's not, you don't have to spend the whole time. It's like, there's a certain number of days in that two year period, but basically after 24 months, if you spend whatever, 12 to 18 months, I forget what it is. Um, in a two-year period, then you're eligible and you could apply for naturalization. Um, what I found is that, uh, you know, in Mexico, there's definitely a bureaucracy, there's definitely, you know, whatever it is, you know, processes that take time. However, uh, I've also come to find that many of these processes can be short-circuited and at least <laughs> expedited. Um, and, you know, things that might take a while end up taking a lot less time um, than you would expect. And so uh, literally, you know, a permanent residency process instead of, you know, really, really long time could take days, weeks. And, you know, by the way, like yours, mm-hmm. you have your residency. Well, um, mine is temporary like, because you, apparently you, I'm too young. <laughs> you know, yours is temporary because you didn't have, you didn't have a child. <laughs> uh, That's true. And, uh, and yeah, and your, uh, yeah, I mean, they, but your temporary can become permanent. But I'll renew after four years and yeah, exactly. Right. And then you'll have a permanent residency. Exactly. Yeah, but your, your, your residency was super fast and you didn't yeah. have to go and people like, Oh, you have to go and bribe somebody. Like you didn't do any of that. No, you it's all legit. Yeah. It was, it was all, it was all good. Yeah. So, so it's been like, it's been a really cool process. So, so yeah, so we'll, so we'll end up with, we'll have permanent residency. We're actually today going to get that paperwork and, and they, and they said, Oh yeah, it should be like a couple of days. Okay. Um, so we'll have that. And then, you know, if we so choose at some point, you know, I mean, again, like I'm in Puerto Rico, I live in Puerto Rico and, and that's, that's the deal. I'm going to continue. That will continue to be the case um, for the foreseeable future. But if some, if at, at some point in my life down the road, I decide, Hey, I want to go live in Mexico. Um, I would be able to come back here. And, you know, after a certain number of days in a two year period, I would be, I myself, 
uh, would be eligible uh, for naturalization and, and a Mexican passport. Mm. So that's really cool. And it might even extend to grandma and grandpa. But I thought it was pretty yeah. cool that grandma and grandpa can get. Um, this is get, definitely uh, like in terms of having it. Right. Yeah, in terms of having second residency, Mexico is definitely the easiest option out of all. Yeah. Especially Super the fact easy. that it it extends to your grandparents. Like the, yeah. you don't ever see that anywhere else. I've never seen it. So yeah. it's 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 a cool thing. So the fun part now is, uh, uh, now this is uh, the, the fun part. This is the not fun part is now I got to go deal with the, the so, so Mexico has been great. Now I got to go deal with the United States. <laughs> Because if I want to go back home to Puerto Rico, um, my child needs a U.S. passport. They won't let her in with a Mexican passport because, you know, uh, whatever. That she's she's got to have a, she's got to have a U.S. She's passport. She's a terrorist. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna be. A, she's a little terrorist. Yeah, so she's got to. So she's got to. Uh, you know, she's got to have her U.S. passport. So the so we knew this was the case, and so like months ago, months ago we realized, okay, like, well, we knew, we knew the process was. So we started looking at it online and, you know, we said, okay, you've got to, when you're born abroad, a child that's born abroad, you've got to go get a certificate of, of birth abroad or something like that. We take the Mexican birth certificate to the U S consulate and then they go, okay, here you go. Here's a U.S. birth certificate. Um, and, uh, and then with that, then you can apply for a passport for the child. All that takes place at the consulate. Now, the consulate uh, only works by appointment. You don't just get to show up to the consulate. Um, you have to have an appointment. And that's always been, that's been the case for a long time, but obviously because of COVID, um, the number of appointments that they give are, are really, really low because they have to limit capacity um, inside of the consulate and all this stuff. And so, so yeah, the number of appointments is very scarce and the number of people that need stuff is you know, kind of increased. So we started looking basically in April saying, okay, well, let's try and get a, let, let's go in advance and try to get a console, uh, a console appointment looking. We had some technical glitch and Zoom decided to kick James out. Apparently they didn't yeah. like what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever I was, I was about, I was about to diss the, uh, the U S government pretty hard. So they apparently Zoom kicked me off my, my own podcast. Um, Anyways, you were talking about like having a, making an appointment at the U S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so yeah. So we knew in advance that we were going to have to make an appointment at the consulate. So we came here in April, we started looking for, you know, something in late June, July, there's nothing available, nothing in August, nothing in September, October, November, December, all the way up to January, no appointments available in all of the cities they have, because they have consulates in Merida, Monterey, Guadalajara, uh, Mexico City, Tijuana, all, I mean, all, and, and nothing available in any of these places. And it's like, so, you know, so we emailed the consulate, like, uh, you know, we're about to have a kid here and we can't get back to the U.S. to, to Puerto Rico until we get a passport, but we can't get a passport unless there's a consular appointment with no appointments. And you know what their answer was? Oh, you just have to make an appointment. <laughs> of course. And it's like, are you like, <laughs> and so we went back and forth with ridiculousness a couple of times. We're just like, uh, I mean, how, how dense are you? Do you not understand this? So we were just basically, it was like this daily ritual. We were just, we, we found out like at what time they would update the appointments and all this. And so we're just like refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And every day, you know, we would look and see, well, maybe there's a cancellation, whatever. And a couple of weeks ago, well, there was some cancellation um, in, in July. And so, with, okay, and we snatched it up. And, uh, you know, you have to fill out a bunch of stuff. It's like, you know, what's the child's name and, and all this, what's the date of birth? We're like, well, I don't know what the date of birth is. <laughs> we haven't had the kid yet, but, um, you know, so anyway, so we, we have the appointment now. And then we started, you know, looking at all the, 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 the rules and the requirements and everything like that. And you just look at them and go, God, this is so stupid <laughs> because, you know, they want all this stuff of like the photo, the photo one is actually the most hilarious because you have to have the the photo and it's like the you know the eyes open looking at the camera and we tried to go do this the other day and you know and she was not having any of it she's, she's like, constantly oh, she's sleeping like, right she's like i don't want to do any of this and so she's asleep and you're like wake up baby you know and trying to get her to like look at the camera and she just she's like crying she gets super stressed whatever and, and you know then so you got these photos and it's like no that's not good enough it's like this is a three-day-old child like what do you expect and so she's 
she's not a terrorist. Like, what do you what what do you want from this? Like, why are you even take why are you even bother taking a photo of a baby that's yeah. going to look totally different in two months? Yeah, you know, and she's but she's going to have this passport photo that they insist she's got to have exactly like this with these dimensions and this background and all this kind of stuff. It's like she can't even hold up her head. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, you know, but like, I can't go back to the U.S. with my child yeah. until all this stuff gets resolved. It's just like, God, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. And like, I'm, I'm just, I know, like, I'm going to have to battle with these people who are just so unyielding and so inflexible and in all these stupid rules that don't actually matter and don't make the world a better place. <laughs> it's just it's just stupid and inconveniencing and it seems like everybody it seems like this should just be common sense, but I just haven't figured this out, you know? Yeah. So anyways, that's the, that's the next challenge. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like I said, in general, like it's been great. All the Mexico stuff has been great. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't be happier. So this is just, yeah. Again, this is just such an incredible story. Yeah. Yeah. As you're a great example of, you don't have to, you don't have to have a baby in Mexico if you want rest. No, you don't. You just, exactly. You just went and did it. Yeah, yeah. anyone can do it. Like I did, uh, I went to the Mexico consulate in the US. We had my appointment. It took about an hour. I did it there. And then I went to Mexico City. It's like step two. Again, it took me about an hour and it was done. Yeah, super, super easy. Yeah. They're so welcoming. Yeah, you had a, you had a very quick experience um, and it was all pleasant except for getting chased by crazy men. Crazy men <laughs> in the and, U.S.? In downtown Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, downtown Las Mexico Vegas. Mexico part was perfect. So, yeah. yeah, so, but that's good. Yeah, I mean, we've written about it a lot um, as plan Bs go for a lot of folks. I, again, everybody has, has his or her own um, you know, likes and dislikes, and there's plenty of places in the world. We've we spent a lot of time talking about Panama. Um, you know, Panama under its Friendly Nations uh, visa program has been great. Um, they are making some changes. Total access members. We did a a, a recording recently with uh, with one of our attorneys there. Uh, I'm going through the process myself uh, next week, yeah. and I'm sure we can do one podcast where I can share my experience after I go yeah. through it. Yeah, yeah, you're going to do it yourself. Um, you know, that's been a, that's kind of long been an easy one, uh, yeah. but they are making some changes to that. It's going to be, I've said this a lot. I mean, I've written about this a lot. I so, said, you know, it's, there's, there, you know, there always, there's a, there's a cost to these things, right? Um, and, and, and a lot of these programs, initially the cost is very low. And when I say cost, I don't necessarily mean like money that you have to pay and fees and things like that. I just mean sort of like the ease, how mm -hmm. easy it is to do these things. And, you know, or like how much you have to invest or how much time it takes or whatever. And the cost is very low. And when you find high quality sort of residency uh, programs that are low cost, i.e. they're really easy and et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, the supply and demand imbalances are eventually going to kick in uh, to where that they're getting flooded with demand. And eventually that means that the cost is going to go up. That's or they'll have to change the law. Yeah. Right, exactly. So that's what happened in Chile. Chile was very, it still is very high quality uh, residency, uh, very high quality passport, all these things. The cost was so low. It was just this easy thing. You show up, you sign a piece of paper, poof. I mean, you know, we all became uh, Chilean residents. It was so easy. Um, and the cost was so low. And then sure enough, sort of word leaked out to like half of the world's developing countries that decided, hey, I want to take advantage of that. And they all showed up and just flooded the system. And now the cost is higher. Not necessarily that they changed anything, but just that there's so much backlog now in the system, it takes forever. Yeah. And so that, that's essentially, I view that as time is a resource. And because it takes more time, Time is a cost, right? So the, the cost increase because it takes more time. In Panama, they're, they're making it more expensive, not necessarily in terms of the, the out-of-pocket fees or anything like that, but in terms of, you know, the investment that they want to see and all these sorts of things. Like it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's not as easy. It's not going to be as easy uh, when the new rules kick in for the Friendly exactly. Nations visa. So this is sort of the thing. It's like when there's a good opportunity that's yeah. on the table, um, it makes sense always to do your due diligence, do your research, make a rational decision about whether or not it's the right option for you. But once you've made that decision, then you should execute, right? Don't mm -hmm. delay, don't exactly. procrastinate, and don't procrastinate on the analysis and the decision making. 
it's one of those things where it's like you see something go it's because i know how this usually works you get something go oh that looks interesting and i'll have to i'll have to i'll have to think about that i'll have to look at that you know later and that's you know that's when you start to lose out on things and whether it's you know investment opportunities or relationships with other people or whatever the case may be i mean yeah, I mean, how many times have we said, oh, that was an interesting person, or that was a very, you know, attractive woman, or whatever, and then just, you know, <laughs> up, then the opportunity's gone. Yeah. <laughs> because then this, that's the thing, is the procrastination, delays, whatever, uh, are this, you know, and, and so it's the same thing with these uh, sorts of, you know, plan B style things. It's an opportunity that's on the table, instead of saying like, oh, I'll have to look into that. I'll have to look into that. No, just look into it. Just do it. You know, get yeah. together with the people that you need to make the decision with your family or whoever else and say, hey, this is what's on the table. Let's understand this. See if it's right for us. And once you make that decision, just don't procrastinate because right. all of a sudden you might find at some point down the road, it won't be tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. But, you know, that's the thing about procrastination is that say, oh, I'll look at it next week or next month turns into next year. And next thing you know, they change the law. So yeah. right now. You know, yeah, this happening in Panama, and then look, there are plenty of places in the world. They've done this with all a lot of these golden residency uh, programs. Yeah, like Portugal where, where just changed the law again. Yeah, you have only a right, couple months you, now. Yeah. Right, uh, where you, yeah, you, you could, you know, used to be you could buy whatever property you wanted to, and you know, you didn't. And now they have all these restrictions and the amount yeah. that you've got to invest, and all these things that have changed. So yeah, when, when you, that's a great lesson is that once you decide, you know, when you, something looks interesting, you should take the time really and decide this is a yes or it's a no. And either option is fine. It's up to you. It's you're the decider here. It's your decision-making process, but whatever it's too expensive or it's not the, the option that I want or whatever it is, doesn't fit into what I want for my plan B um, fine, but make the decision and rule it out or rule it in whatever the case may be. And then if you got some action to take, then do it because these things won't be, they, they just don't linger around forever. So yeah, that's an that's important very thing true. to bear in mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And thanks again for sharing your story. And I hope we'll be chatting again next week. Okay. All right. We have three in a row. So exactly. we're on a streak now. So thanks everybody for listening. All right. Thank you.